It's finally time, Breaking Bad, a show that needs no introduction. Everyone knows what it is, everyone's seen it, and it's pretty much recognized as the greatest TV show of all time, which is a pretty crazy feat. But even all these years later, it's still one of the most praised and talked about series ever. Even in the golden age of television, this was the one that stood out above the rest. So what made Breaking Bad so special? Was it the great writing, amazing performances, cinematography, plot, characters? Well, it doesn't really boil down down to just one element. Rather, I think Breaking Bad is the perfect storm when it comes to everything that makes a good TV drama series. And so today, like I did already with Better Call Saul, we're going to rank every episode of this masterpiece of a series. Also, if you disagree with any of the placements on this list, or have your own top 5 or top 10 list, make sure to drop it down below. I'd love to read your guys' thoughts on this. And also, make sure to stick around to the end of the video to hear my closing thoughts on if I was really being hyperbolic or not with my comparison of Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad, and I'll break down once and for all which I believe is the better series. But without further ado, this is Every Breaking Bad Episode Ranked. Number 62, Shotgun. In my opinion, the weakest episode of Breaking Bad, but still not a bad episode of television. None of them are, really. Even the slowest and weakest entries still have great scenes, and this episode is no different. It's just that it is kind of slow-paced, and some moments and plot beats are a bit contrived. First of all, it starts with Walt freaking out, understandably, thinking Jesse is going to be killed, and possibly even him too, but no. For some reason, instead of killing him, Mike takes him out to drives out in the desert and other places to pick up dead drops. Jesse really thinks he's him, but Mike tells him he's not that guy. You're not that guy, pal. Trust me. You're not that guy. Okay. Okay. Are you? But Gus and Mike are getting their claws into Jesse slowly but surely, realizing he can be exploited in a way that Walt can't, because he's actually loyal and has a heart. I'm honestly surprised though that Jesse went back to pick up Mike, like bruh, this guy just tried to kill you like a few episodes ago, which in real time was like what, like a few weeks ago maybe? Walt and Skyler also finally buy the car wash from Bogdan, and Walt actually struggles in the lab without Jesse's help, which is kinda surprising. Hank is finally through with the investigation, thinking Heisenberg was Gale, case closed closed, right? Until Walt has an ego moment and wants all the credit, telling Hank that this Heisenberg may still be out there and that this Gale wasn't actually his guy, which actually motivates Hank to keep going. And this was obviously a terrible call on Walt's part because he starts to look further into the case and discovers Los Pollos Hermanos, but I have no problem with this scene. Actually, I think it's the best in the episode and well in line with Walt's character and personality. But it's just, compared to the other episodes, this one stands out as a bit weaker in my opinion. Number 61, No Moss. Despite a pretty interesting opening with the cousins looking for Heisenberg, it's kind of a boring episode, at least compared with some of the others. Although there's definitely some good scenes in here, don't get me wrong, like Walt starting to adopt the habits of those he kills, which is something I always loved, starting with Crazy Eight's aversion to bread crust. We also get that great half a million in cash line with Walt and Hank, and Walt even also admits he's a drug dealer and is kicked out of the house by Skyler, and goes to live with Jesse. He also tries to burn all of his money for some reason, as if that's gonna help any of his problems, but he obviously immediately regrets this, and also gives a really cringe speech about the plane crash, showing how much of his humanity he's already lost at this point. However, he's still out of the game, rejecting Gus's offer initially, refusing to accept who he is as a criminal, when Jesse does the exact opposite, openly accepting that he is the bad guy, in his own words. Later on, the cousins are smuggled into the border and kill everyone and blow up the truck without looking at it, because I mean, cool guys don't look at explosions, even though, you know, that shit was like burning them basically, and all without saying a single word this episode. I mean, don't get me wrong, these guys are pretty cool, but they're definitely the most cartoonish characters in the series. They really just don't feel like they belong in this universe, if I'm being honest. Still a fine episode. Number 60, 38 Snub. Now, despite the amazing introduction to Season 4, it kind of starts off slow after Box Cutter, really taking off in the later half of the season. So this episode is just kind of low-key, but not necessarily bad by any means. It's named after the pistol that Walt buys at the beginning in preparation for eventually killing Gus, knowing his time is limited, even though they bought themselves just a bit of it. Jesse buys a Roomba, which I didn't even know they had these back then, and a loud sound system trying to drown out the pain after killing Gale, and also starts 
starts getting back heavy into drugs. Anything he can do to forget, I guess. Not allowing any time to himself or his thoughts. Constantly blaring music in his ears, even at work. Badger and Skinny talk about Resident Evil 4 and Left 4 Dead and even COD Zombies, and I can't believe this actually made it into the show, but it's awesome, and surprisingly up to date for the time in terms of zombie games. It doesn't even really come off as like boomer gaming references or anything. In other news, Hank is still recovering and playing with rocks, <clears throat> I mean minerals, and Skylar wants to buy the car wash, while Walt attempts to kill Gus before he is stopped by Mike, who is fed up with his recent antics and beats him up in a bar. As Walt tries to manipulate Mike, wanting him to kill Gus because of what he did to Victor, but Mike's learned his lesson to not listen to whatever Walt says and doesn't fall for his talk no jutsu. Still though, a decent episode. Number 59, IFT. So for a long time, I had no idea what the title of this episode meant or stood for, but fun fact, it's I f Ted, which I guess they didn't just have that be the title because, well, spoilers. Anyway, besides that, we get a pretty random flashback of Tortuga being killed, the turtle guy, but it does introduce Juan Bolsa, so that's fine, because eventually he meets with Hector and Gus, connecting all the stories together basically, and Gus actually stops them from killing Walt. Back at home, the drama between Skylar and Walt though continues, and he actually calls her bluff, which is pretty epic because she won't say anything in front of their son, which makes her actually look like the bad guy even more to Flynn. She ends up admitting to her attorney though that her husband does cook meth, but that doesn't really go anywhere. Also, Walt pisses in the sink instead of outside while Skylar is in the bathroom, which is hilarious but also dumb. And Hank doesn't want to go back to El Paso and gets in a fight to not go, while Jesse continues to struggle with Jane's death and starts cooking again. Decent episode. Number 58, Green Light. Another alright episode. To be honest, season 3 started out pretty slow before it really got going. The best part of this episode is Walt and Saul fighting over him bugging his house, which Mike has to break up and then eventually actually remove them from his house, and we get a great conversation between him and Walt, with the irony being that he was only able to save Walt's life because of the bugs that they had. Other than that, Jesse buys gas with meth, being the smart guy that he is, and shows Walt his batch of blue meth, which infuriates him, and Jesse tries to sell it to Gus, who only takes it to get Walt back in the game, because he knew his ego wouldn't let it stand. Also, Walt confronts Ted but is thrown out by security, and on top of that, Walt also gets fired from his job, because he tries to seduce the principal to get back at Skylar for cheating with Ted, but that obviously fails and is very, very cringe. Number 57, Cornered. The most memorable part of this episode that steals the show is the I'm the one who knocks scene. And I like that Skylar tells Walt that he's not a hardened criminal, when in reality she couldn't be more wrong, and he's actually proud of it. Definitely got chills at this scene. My next favorite part though is definitely the one where Bogdan gives Walt advice as the new boss, telling him he needs to be tough and not show weakness, which he of course uses in his other business venture. But Bogdan also wants his first dollar back, but Walt is petty and won't give it back because he bought the car wash as is, and even takes it a step further and uses it to buy a drink at the vending machine. That's not just a dollar, it's Mr. Krabs' first dollar, his most prized possession. Back at no! Mike and Jesse keep working together, doing busy work essentially, and I don't really understand why Jesse is getting so close with Mike, even though he literally tried to kill both him and Walt earlier. It was also cool though to see the pimento cheese sandwich return. I didn't even remember this was a thing in Breaking Bad, I thought they just made that up for Better Call Saul. Other than that, Walt is just acting really stupid this episode, like he buys Flynn a brand new car despite them trying to not look suspicious, then despite being onto Gus's scheme with Jesse, knowing the robbery was a setup, he wears it in the most tone deaf and hilarious way, but definitely is something Walt would say, which of course pisses Jesse off. It's all about me. Bruh. And next, because it's not over, he does something even dumber just to get Gus mad, having the laundromat workers help him clean the lab when Jesse dips out. Yeah, definitely not Walt's finest hour. Number 56, Open House. Again, quite a slow episode in early season 4. Walt and Skylar talk about Mike hitting him in the face for like 5 minutes. Murray is stressed out because Hank is still being a dick, and so she keeps visiting open houses and is back to stealing stuff, and Hank has to intervene when she is finally caught. And he actually gets back involved in the Heisenberg investigation with the death of Gail. And man, why couldn't Walt just go on that go-kart trip with Jesse? It would have been just so wholesome. Something tells me a lot of the things that happened in this show could have been avoided. Jesse is also still 
numb inside from the whole Gale thing and doesn't even react to people destroying his house. Also, I love how Walt acts like 79k is nothing here, and Skylar negotiates with Bogdan to wiggle the price down for the car wash. And she does actually end up getting it. Overall, it's a fine episode. Number 55. 51. So this is probably the only mid episode in season 5 if you can even call it that. It's not even that bad, it just doesn't live up to the other episodes in this half or this whole season for that matter. I mean you are talking about one of the most critically acclaimed seasons of any television show ever. And it's also sandwiched between two easy top 10 episodes for me, so what are you gonna do? Mostly it's just drama between Walt and Skylar, which at this point in the series is starting to get a little dull. I mean we've had the same song and dance for like 5 seasons now. Anyway, Walt turns 51. Mark marking a year since the beginning of the series, and it's crazy because watching this show it feels like a lot more of time has passed, considering everything that's happened up until this point, and I mean Walt is nothing like he was just a year ago, so it's pretty crazy. He and everyone else has changed quite a lot. Speaking of, Walt sells his old car for 50 bucks and buys a new car for him and Walt Jr. Clearly his ego and pride has reached new heights. Skylar is obviously mad about this, but the way she goes about getting the kids out of the house is so bizarre. I can't think of any other word to describe it. Basically, Hank and Marie visit on Walt's birthday, and Skylar goes into the pool like she's gonna drown herself? Maybe? I don't really know, but this is definitely the moment that Skylar became Donna Laudio. So Hank and Marie take the kids back to their place, so her ploy actually worked, and she tells him she can't wait for his cancer to come back. And I think the most annoying thing about Skylar is how wishy-washy her character is in the show. One moment she hates Walt and won't talk to him, and the next she's willing to launder money for him. Then she hates him again, it just feels so inconsistent. Nothing wrong with Anna Gunn's performance at all, in fact she does great in most scenes she's in. I think this is actually on the writers here, writing her more around the story for each individual episode instead of giving her a more focused and motivated perspective on Walt's business and just being a better, more understandable character overall. Overall. They really didn't know exactly what they wanted to do with her, and she would just kind of mold to the plot. Because even after all this drama, she still agrees to launder his money for him. Like, bruh. Anyways, besides that, Hank is promoted to ASAC and investigates the stolen barrel of methylamine, which Mike thinks Lydia had something to do with to stop them from taking it and is going to actually kill her before she promises to get them more. Also, Jesse gets Walt a birthday present, a watch, which is sweet, and one of their last wholesome moments together. It's a fine episode, just nothing spectacular in my opinion. Number 54, Moss. So this episode and the next one in season 3, Sunset, focus a lot on the RV, including a flashback of how Jesse actually got it, with him just wasting Walt's money that he gave to him back in season 1 and just getting it from Combo. Hank is also investigating it in the present time thanks to the gas station thing with Jesse and eventually ties it back to him. Walt is smart and sees through Gus's plan to get him cooking again, but he is still manipulated by Gus exploiting his pride and his desire to provide for his family. He also shows him the super lab, which probably sweet the deal at least a bit. Walt finally meets with Jesse again and gives him his money, but also tells him to stop cooking and flexes on him that he took the job working for Gus. After accepting this new work order, Walt also finally signs the divorce papers. It's more so a setup for the next episode, season 3 episode 6, but it's still a great one. Number 53, Peekaboo. In this episode, Jesse has to deal with Spooge and his girlfriend to get the money back that they stole from him, and he finds their decrepit house and actually a kid living there, and we don't often really get to see the effect of the meth they produce on these people and their families, but in this episode we really just focus in on that. Also going on is Gretchen revealing that they weren't paying for the treatment, and Walt goes off on her like he's wanted to for a very long time considering he was cut out of the company, and it's very cathartic for Walt, and you can tell. And her saying she feels sorry for him was just about the worst thing she could have possibly said to him in that moment. But Walt somehow keeps up with the lie with Skylar, and like a lot of mid season 2, not saying it's mid, I mean the middle of the season, it's kind of slow paced until that wild ending where Spooge's girlfriend drops the ATM on his head, and of course the money just pops right out when Jesse tries to wipe away his fingerprints. Some of that classic Breaking Bad black comedy. Number 52, Down. So Walt's manipulation and lying skills are going crazy in this episode. Literally no one would be able to beat this guy at Among Us or Town of Salem or Mafia or anything. Walt, I don't know man. You've been seeming sus lately. Some 
Looks like we have an imposter among us. Basically, he tries to get back into the good graces of his family, which doesn't go so well, with Skyler just ignoring him, which is pretty annoying, especially considering this man just disappeared, but it still does kind of make sense because of the whole second cell phone plot. But she's also smoking, which obviously isn't good for the baby, and it seems like she's just doing it to have her own secret. Anyway, Jesse gets kicked out of his house, Walt Jr. wants to start going by Flynn for some reason, I guess to distance himself from Walt, even though he hasn't really done anything yet that they know of, and Jesse is homeless and tries to to sleep in the RV, and basically every bad thing that could happen to him does happen. Man gets evicted, bike stolen, can't get paid by Walt, and falls into a porta potty. Jesse does end up actually stealing the RV back though, which was dope. And on top of all that, Walt takes out all his anger on Jesse and they have a fight. Great acting here as usual from the two, but still a pretty slow episode, but a great one nonetheless. Number 51, Abiquiu. Following Fly, we have Abiquiu, at least I think that's how you say it, and it's kind of a slow burn and a setup for the next two bangers in Season 3. That being said, there is some good stuff here, like the Jesse and Jane flashback for example, the iconic Kevin Cosner line from Saul, and the dinner with Gus at his home, which is a good scene because it's one of the only times in the show that we get this intimate with the character. But there's also some questionable stuff in here as well, like for some reason Walt agrees to let Skylar meet Saul Goodman and starts to get her more involved in his business, and she even brings up the car wash for a money laundering operation. And also Andrea is introduced this episode which is fine, but to add to the already crazy amount of coincidences in this universe, Andrea explains how her brother was the kid who shot Combo, which is fine for drama purposes and leads to Jesse confronting him at the end of the episode, but doesn't take it out on him and rather plots revenge against the two gang members. But if I had one overall critique of Breaking Bad, it's that too much of the plot relies on convenience and very improbable odds at least in the first half of the show. And you can chalk that up to like themes of fate or whatever, but that's kind of lazy writing, like come on. I mean, they make it look like Albuquerque is like a small town or something. Definitely not hating on the show here, just something I thought would be worth pointing out. Number 50, Bullet Points. Starting it off, Mike gets part of his ear shot off, but don't worry, it grows back apparently, and Skylar and Walt try to get their story straight with the gambling thing, which I get is necessary for the story, obviously explaining their money, but it's kind of boring, not gonna lie. Although the fact that these two actors are pretending to act reading off fictional scripts in the story is pretty funny, but this part just goes on for way too long in my opinion. Hank keeps looking into Gale and actually thinks he's Heisenberg, and he even shows Walt a video of Gale, which is infinitely depressing, but it's scenes like this that prove how effective dramatic irony can really be, especially in a long-running TV series like this with hours and hours of buildup and converging plotlines. And Walt also pulls a light Yagami here, trying to get involved in the investigation, which is pretty sick, and he gets to read the files on Gale and the lab to see what Hank knows so far. Also we get the iconic, you got me scene. Best part of the episode hands down in my opinion, and definitely bumps it up a few notches on my list. Walt also grills Jesse for details about the murder, and he is finally forced to relive it, which makes him panic, and he has some random dudes throw Walt out of his house. Meanwhile, all his money is stolen from a drawer, and he doesn't even really care, but Mike takes it back, and it seems like he's going to actually have Jesse killed, which culminates in that last scene, where he is missing from his house for a pretty scary cliffhanger. Number 49, Breakage. Starting off the episode, we have another great cold open, with a man finding Tuco's grill, which was last in Hank's possession, which is pretty foreboding at first sight. But honestly, this is more of a low-key episode. I know I've been saying that a lot, but that's how these early ones are. We get Jesse meeting Jane, the goth GF landlord. Hank gets a promotion, but starts to have a panic attack. And it's cool to see that Hank isn't exactly a complete badass like everyone thinks, and we see him throw the grill away even, as it reminds him too much of his encounter with Tuco, as he starts to suffer from PTSD from that incident. Then Walt and Jesse set up their own distribution, and Jesse calls him Walt instead of Mr. White, which has that Vegeta calling Kakarot Goku energy. Everything with these two though is gold, what can I say, amazing chemistry between them. Pun absolutely intended, of course. By the way, Jesse is absolutely right in this sequence. Walt admiring Tuka right now is crazy too, he's trying to be more like him and gives Jesse back his gun to handle the situation with Skinny Pete getting robbed, but they also bring up the shoplifting drama again, and at this point I'm kind of over it. In universe it wasn't that long ago, but it was like last season in the show. Also Walt finds cigarettes flushed down the toilet because she couldn't have just thrown them away I guess, like a normal person. Overall still a decent episode. Number 48, Caballo Sin Nombre. 
Better said as the pizza roof episode, I think. Probably the most memorable moment in it, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, mind you, just kind of funny. Basically the whole episode, though, is just things turning from bad to worse for Walter. He gets pulled over and pepper sprayed by a cop in the beginning, and I love how they don't show the whole interaction, it just cuts to him arrested in the back of the car, although Hank does get him out. Then of course there's the whole divorce situation, which he consults Saul on, and Walt even says, I can't be the bad guy. The antithesis of Jesse acknowledging that he is the bad guy and accepting it. While Walt is miserable, Jesse is actually free. In other news, we get more Mike in this episode, which is always good. Then the cousins visit Hector, and for some reason there is a Ouija board in the nursing home, which is just hilarious. I have to think that it's only there for Hector to talk to people, which he does use to spell out Walter White, which is probably the best part of the episode. Oh, who am I kidding? It has to be this masterpiece. Actually, just kidding, I changed my mind. This is the best scene. Restraining on a right here! Restraining this! And despite this honestly being a pretty funny episode, the ending is quite ominous and tense, with the cousins arriving at Walt's house to kill him before they're called off by Mike and Gus. Number 47. Over. Despite the haunting opening and sick ending, this is a rather slowish episode, a wind down from the last two back to back thrill rides that were four days out and Better Call Saul. But wow, that opening, what a powerful image. Seeing two dead bodies in Walt's driveway in a flash forward was a wild way to open up. But after that we get to see everyone happy about Walt being in remission, including Jesse, except for himself. Walt starts to have a midlife crisis scenario after finding out he's gonna live for a while longer, and we also get that cringe scene between Walt and Hank. I love seeing Walt so obsessed with taking over his own life, but holy cringe. He also starts doing some home improvement stuff because he's not cooking anymore and doesn't know what to do with his life. He basically just tries as hard as he can to be macho and assert dominance this episode, which culminates in that epic final scene. Stay out of my territory. But other than that, there's not that much to write home about. Just some development in Jane and Jesse's relationship, and Skylar and Ted's, but that's about it. Number 46, Grey Matter. We finally dive into Walt's past and learn a bit about Grey Matter, the company that he founded, but they really laid it on thick with this birthday scene for Elliot. Really, I don't remember it going on that long. Maybe it's the Blu-ray I'm watching this on, like an extended cut or something, I don't know. Anyway, Elliot offers to pay for his treatment and give him a job, which is great because it offers an easy solution which Walt turns down, showing us not only more of Walt's pride and ego-driven personality, but also how this show likes to present easy solutions only to to ditch them in pursuit of more interesting dynamics and stories. It's kind of a more subtle thing, but it is greatly appreciated and is the mark of good writing in my opinion. It's also cool to see Jesse actually learning stuff about chemistry here too, and showing off the badger. Also great cooking montage as usual. Jesse basically becomes a meth cooking tryhard overnight, and leaves badger out in the desert, and we get Walt's treatment intervention. Amazing performances all around here. And ultimately though, he does decide to go through with it, deciding that he'd still rather cook meth then take a handout. Overall it's a good episode that some may consider a little slow, but it's definitely a necessary one. Number 45, Bit by a Dead Bee. This episode is more so dealing with the aftermath of the incident with Tuco in the desert, which it does a great job at. Basically Walt and Jesse need alibis for disappearing, and re-watching this hitchhiking scene, it's obvious that Aaron Paul is trying not to laugh at this point, knowing that this is the scene with so many bloopers, which is hilarious. I don't know, Mr. White, do you think that this <laughs> I'm anticipating it not working. It's gonna work. I don't know. I don't know. Do you think that this will work, man? I don't want to be out here anymore. Also, why didn't Jesse go with Walt? Anyway, Jesse pretends that the money isn't his, and we get some development on his side, starting to learn from his mentor Walt and becoming smarter in the business. Then with Walt, his crazy plan is to pretend to have amnesia from a fugue state and walk into a store naked, which was pretty genius I have to admit. Also, the dramatic irony of Hank looking into the case is just so satisfying. It reminds me of early Death Note. But what the hell was this scene? Still a good aftermath episode. Number 44. I see you. A lot of the times when they have a crazy episode like one minute, they sort of wind down in the next one, dealing with the aftermath of whatever crazy thing just happened, which is exactly what they do here with Hank almost dying. Which Jesse actually sees and makes him happy, which seems kind of out of character for him to be honest, like I get he beat him up, but still. 
This is the guy who cried for days about killing a meth cook. Speaking of which, Walt having to fire Gale here kind of hurt me. This man is so innocent, as innocent as a meth cook can be anyway. Point is, the man did not deserve any of this. It doesn't help that Jesse also shows up in the middle of it as his replacement. During this time, Jesse's also being annoying in the lab, trying to cook on his own and just goofing around, which Victor walks in on. Jesse also has to be the one to break the news about Hank to Walt, and Marie is understandably upset with the whole situation and is blaming literally anything and everything on the shooting, including a dirty fork and even Walt, which, I mean, she's right, but she doesn't know it and instead is mad at him for simply buying buying pot off Jesse. So yeah, the beginning part of the episode is kind of whatever, but the later parts in the hospital are great. Because first of all, Gomez shows Walt the surviving twin in a really creepy scene where he reveals he's missing his legs, but starts crawling towards him as he knows he's actually Heisenberg. However, Mike ends up finishing the job so we don't have to worry about him anymore. But that's not all, because of course Hank survives, and on top of that, in an even crazier encounter, Walt sees Gus at the hospital. And after all that, Gus also even has Juan Bolsa killed in a full-on takeover of the drug trade, basically. This second half definitely carried this episode for sure. Number 43, Kafka-esque. This episode really shows us how much of a professional Gus really is, and how deep into the game he is at this point. And a great way they show this is through a complex distribution montage transitioned from a Los Poyos commercial, which is great stuff. Jesse and Walt talk about their pay and how Jesse thinks they're getting cheated, but more importantly bring up what's gonna happen in three months when they're done. Also quite ironic that Jesse is the one that's complaining about pay here and not Walt. Saul also teaches Jesse about money laundering and wants him to buy a nail salon and this is literally like a GTA cutscene in the best possible way. Like he just walks into a mission or something right here. Jesse is starting to basically get fed up with organized crime, which is the opposite of Walt who respects it entirely. For Jesse, it's not really about the money with him. He preferred the freedom and the hustle and the fun of just slinging with his friends, not having to pay taxes and launder money, produce quotas, and show up to work for grueling long shifts. So he starts skimming off the top as it were, and it's pretty messed up, but Badger and Skinny Pete try to sell meth using Jesse's rehab group. In fact, they advertise the blue stuff as the best they've ever tried. Meanwhile, Walt figures out it was Gus that saved him and Hank's lives and is grateful and obviously respects his game, but asks what will happen after the three months, and he offers him a contract extension, which for some reason makes Walt suicidal, at least temporarily. And finally, Skylar tells Marie about their money, but says that they got it gambling, and agrees to help pay Hank's bills. She's a really good liar here, like really, this was such an elaborate story. Walt even says he did very well, clearly proud of his accomplishment. For a fairly low-key episode, this is a very solid piece of Season 3. Number 42, Negro E. Azul. First off, we get the great Heisenberg song, which was pretty random, but a really cool way to open up the episode. Walt is smart and figures out Jesse didn't kill the people that stole from him, but they still get paid, and Walt of course uses it to their advantage to make Jesse seem intimidating, making it seem like Jesse killed Spooge with the ATM machine. Meanwhile, Hank joins a drug task force in El Paso and is way out of his depth, some good cringe moments there. Also, Jesse's friends meet Heisenberg for the first time, which is pretty sick. He hears that they learned about the ATM thing, and he even plays it up even further, leaving with the smile. Love that. Walt then plans to expand the territory, which obviously ends up leading to Combo's death later on. Gotta love how greedy Walt is getting, I mean it gets real bad later on, but we can even see it here. After expanding and cornering the market as he calls it, he even wants to raise the price, and can never really just take a W. True Sigma grind set. Also Blowfish. You are a Blowfish. What? Next we get the start of the Ted storyline, which... <sighs> And of course then there's the turtle scene with Hank, which is quite shocking and disturbing. But I do think it's kind of funny that he gets sick here, even though he was laughing at the dude with his arms cut off last season. A little inconsistent, but I guess his perspective changed when he killed Tuco? Maybe? Also, I thought cartels didn't kill DEA. At least that's what Narcos taught me, I don't know. Actually, wait a minute, Gus also says that later on in Season 3. Either way, still though, it's a solid episode. Number 41. Buried. 
So here we have more of a setup episode yet again. Not all of them can be the off the wall crazy stuff, but it still gets some good plot progression going. Hank meets with Skylar at a restaurant to help her get away from Walt, but she actually stands by him for some reason. Huel and Kubi lay on the money and think about going to Mexico, but they're too scared of Walt to steal his money. Meanwhile, Saul wants to send Hank to Belize, but the one thing Walt isn't willing to do is hurt family. It's the only thing he puts above his ego and business at this point. Walt then tries to bury his money in the desert and doesn't let anyone help so he's the only one to know the location. Skylar tells Marie the truth and she tries to take the baby but Skylar won't let them. Great acting here all around. Lydia meets with Declan and she tells him to use Todd as the cook but he doesn't want to and so Jack's gang ruthlessly kills them and takes over the market. And we get to see Todd's crush on Lydia. Aw, uh, how cute. Escorting the girl you like through a field of recently made corpses. Lydia at least has some humanity here, not wanting to see the death and destruction. Of course the only named character though of the bunch is still barely alive, so Jack can finish him off. Also very creepy end credits song here. Number 40. Cancer Man. So this is the episode that Walt admits to his family that he has cancer. Good performance here by Anna Gunn, who definitely doesn't get enough credit in the show. And we also get a few more character introductions here, like Skinny Pete, Combo, and Jesse's family. Also it's revealed that presumably the reason behind the bust in episode 1 was actually Crazy 8, as he was a DEA informant working with Hank and Gomez, which is something that doesn't come up much in this show, but is definitely a huge point in Better Call Saul. It's also nice to get a bit more character building on Walt here. We get some subtle hints about his ego here and there, with him desperately wanting to be the sole provider of his family, which leads to some drama with him and Walt Jr. Oh, and Walt blows up Ken's car, so for a fairly low-key episode, it has quite the explosive conclusion. Number 39, 737. Season 2 opens with an ominous cold open, leaving a season-long mystery. We're given a few hints to it throughout the episodes, including this one, especially with the amount of cash that Walt thinks he needs before he can quit, which is 737000 but 737 also represents the Boeing 737 airliner that crashes at the end of the season. There's also that weird almost scene with him and Skyler because of just how much the drug deals and violence turns him on. The Marie drama continues and it's kinda whatever for the most part, but we get a great performance here from Anna Gunn. Also Hank is investigating the methylamine heist and acts as an audience surrogate here. Hey try rolling it morons, it's a barrel. It rolled, Jesus. <laughs> Walt and Jesse debate killing Tuco, which is kind of weird considering it's like a few days later in the timeline, even though it's a new season. Like in reality, they just started working for this dude. But we also get the first of many appearances of Ryson. And also Hank happens to be at the crime scene of Gonzo, who died trying to hide Nodoz's body. And we get an amazing cliffhanger for the season premiere with Tuco kidnapping Walt and Jesse. Number 38, Fly. Alright, here we go, the infamous Fly episode, the most controversial episode of Breaking Bad and what some consider to be one of, if not the only bad episode. While some say it's actually a hidden gem and possibly even a masterpiece. I don't really fall into either of these camps, but I do think it is a really solid piece of television actually, and I personally think it's far from the worst episode in the series, and definitely not a bad one. And as far as bottle episodes go, it's quite memorable. Set in mostly one location with a simple premise, but it's done well and it's a complete story on its own, even if it is a straightforward one. Basically Walt and Jesse try to kill a loose fly in the lab, and reveal quite a bit about their characters in the process. And it starts out fun and silly, but gradually evolves evolves into a grittier reflection on their personalities, mostly Walt though. Besides, any episode with Walt and Jesse at the forefront can't be bad, I mean their chemistry can and actually does carry the episode. It's also crazy to note that the universally highest rated episode and the lowest rated episodes on IMDb were both directed by Ryan Johnson. There's also quite a few all time great lines and scenes in here. Is there a discernible point to this story? A point that you... He'll be arriving at sometime in the near future. So you're chasing around a fly, and in your world, I'm the idiot. 
But at the end of the day, it's all about Walt's pride over his product, and Jesse even tells him that they make poison for people who don't care, and he's right. So Jesse drugs Walt so he can finish the batch, and during this conversation between the two is one of the only emotionally vulnerable times for Walt with Jesse. And he even expresses regret for Jane's death here, but doesn't actually admit to anything. Number 37, Madrigal. This episode marks the start of Heisenberg's historic rise in the meth business, as after killing Gus, he chooses to get back into the game, recruiting both Jesse and Mike for a three-way partnership. Him and Jesse being the cooks, and Mike handling distribution. And speaking of Mike, he does quite a bit in this episode. He's interviewed by Hank and Gomez, and it's great stuff. And it's because of Mike's money he wanted to leave for his granddaughter, being taken away by the cops, that he has to start working with Walt. He's also almost killed by Lydia hiring a hitman, but Mike is able to outsmart them, and instead of killing Lydia, he gets her to get the methylamine that Walt needs to start cooking again. Meanwhile, Jesse breaks down over almost killing Walt, as he manages to make another rice and cigarette and hide it in Jesse's apartment to tie up all loose ends. And they also brainstorm new meth lab locations with Saul, which is fun as always. Solid episode, just not as crazy as the other ones in this amazing first half of season 5. Number 36, Problem Dog. Walt is still in his childish phase and starts doing donuts in Flynn's car before blowing it up in dramatic fashion after Skylar told him to take it back. I feel like at this point Walt has pretty much given up on living, thinking that Gus is going to kill him soon. He even flexes on Skylar, pulling up with all his money, which is just too much to launder. But he hasn't given up entirely and talks with Saul about how to deal with Gus, including using Jesse to poison him with ricin, which he agrees to. And that ricin is actually later turned into the cigarette, which which becomes a very important thing later on in the season, and for the rest of the show, really. But to make matters worse for both Walt and Gus, Hank starts looking into Los Poyos, and he actually brings up some of this evidence to the DEA, but he actually sounds like a conspiracy theorist, and they don't really buy it, understandably, as there really is no solid evidence. And Hank thinks Gus is involved, but they just don't see it, until he gets fingerprint evidence of him actually being at Gail's apartment. And remember, all of this is Walt's fault. Hank was going to give up on the case until Walt told him not to because of his pride and his ego. The highlight of this episode though is Jesse confessing to the killing of Gale to his drug group, saying he had to put down a dog, a problem dog, which I think really helps him get through the guilt and the pain. Amazing acting here by Aaron Paul, he completely killed this scene. He even admits to being there to sell them meth, I mean everything that's been building up with him just comes out here. One of his best scenes and performances of the entire show for him. Number 35, Bug. Starts with quite a foreboding opening sequence of a bloodied Walt picking up his glasses in a flash forward, which of course we find out by the end was from him fighting with Jesse in a heartbreaking scene, where while Jesse is worried about going to Mexico to teach the formula, Walt gets mad for him not killing Gus, telling him he'll die and end up in a barrel somewhere. But rewinding back to before this, Walt basically thinks he's done for, and I love the way that he doesn't even know how to smoke a cigarette, but tries to just make small talk with Jesse. Hank is looking into the distribution center, and so Mike and Jesse have to clean it up, but suddenly they're attacked by the cartel, and Gus just walks into the fray, not flinching at the gunshots at all, which is just so badass. Ted gets back involved with Skylar because he's getting audited by the IRS and is being criminally investigated, along with Skylar because she worked for him, and she shows up to help in the investigation, and acts all dumb and suggestive to try to make it seem like they just made mistakes or something. I don't really know, I'm not a finance guy, but yeah. Apparently this somehow works. Jesse then goes to Gus's house to meet with him and even tries to poison him, but this once again fails. Every time these assassination attempts don't work on Gus, it gives him an aura of invulnerability. At this point, he feels almost unkillable. Gus also asks Jesse if he can cook Walt's formula, implying he's going to get rid of Mr. White, but Jesse doesn't go for it and tells him, you kill Mr. White, you're gonna have to kill me too. And despite their problems, I love this loyalty from Jesse here. Makes that fight at the end even more sad. Number 34, Rabid Dog. Everything comes crumbling down with Walt and Jesse's relationship here. Gone are the partners and that father-son dynamic. Both are finally out to end each other, with Walt finally at the end of the episode calling Todd to kill Jesse. 
but before this happens, it kind of moves slower, all things considered, which of course isn't necessarily a bad thing. So Walt goes to his house and sees Jesse parked out front, but nowhere to be found. Although we later find out he was picked up by Hank, and the two team up to take down Walt. Never thought I'd see the day that these two work together. Meanwhile, Walt tries to get the gasoline smell out of his house, but it doesn't really work, and he has to come up with a crazy story about how it got in there, and this guy is so good at lying it's actually scary. But Skyler has basically had it with his stories and doesn't buy it, and even Walt Jr. doesn't believe it, and gives him an even better lie saying he probably passed out at the pump. Either way, it gives him an excuse to get them out of the house. His buddies, Beaver and what's his name? Uh, Bruh, Walt doesn't even remember Badger and Skinny Pete's names. I mean, you almost got arrested for this guy. But that's not even the best line from this great scene. Okay, but say, you know, just for the sake of argument, the kid's not in the mood for a nuanced discussion of the virtues of child poisoning, you know. It's also, Saul suggests killing Jesse, and he says, do not float this idea again with me, but like literally the next day, he's like, f*** it, just kill him. Marie also talks with her therapist, which is kind of, well, nothing. Walt is so narcissistic that he thinks he can explain the poisoning of Brock to Jesse and get him to actually agree with his actions, which is just baffling. Mr. White, he's the devil. You know, he is. He is smarter than you. He is luckier than you. Yeah, just so many great lines in this one. And finally, Jesse tries to meet Walt in person to finally get him to admit to his crimes, but neither budge, and instead Jesse thinks of another way, while Walt finally decides to deal with his rabid dog. Number 33, ABQ. Here in the season 2 finale, we finally get the payoff to the black and white openers in the beginning of the season, with it all tying back to Jane's death, which caused her father, who was an air traffic controller, to cause a plane crash. And a lot, and I mean a lot of coincidences, really were needed to make all of this happen this way, but it's still quite an unexpected thing on first viewing. Regardless, Jesse tries to save Jane, but she's already gone, and just to add to the tragedy, Donald actually sees his daughter dead. Walt also ends up saving Jesse from a meth house, and it's such a sad and tragic moment for both characters, with Jesse breaking down crying and Walt holding him like a son. And Jesse even says that he himself killed her, not knowing until late season 5 that it was actually Walt. On a bit of a lighter note, we get the introduction of Mike, who was only here to fill in for Bob Odenkirk Salt Goodman, but ended up becoming a series staple and fan favorite character. Walt also gets more donations from the website Money Laundering and the police department as well, including a sponsor, that being of course Gus Fring, learning that Walt is Hank's brother-in-law. And of course that wild ending to the season-long mystery of Wayfair 515, causing the deaths of 167 people, showing the far-reaching consequences of Walt's actions. And this is all juxtaposed with Walt actually getting his surgery and appearing on local news, with Walt Jr. even talking about how great of a guy he is, which makes him tear up and also reinforces the themes of children and parents in this season. Finally as well, Skylar puts it all together and wants a divorce. Pretty great finale, despite a few contrivances and coincidences that it took to get here. Number 32, a no rough stuff type deal. The finale of season 1. We get Walt starting to become a different person here, or so it seems, being turned on by the crimes he commits and even becoming greedy at the deal with Tuco. I love how Jesse just keeps looking at Walt when he says crazy shit. Also yeah, science, which is great. Yeah Mr. White! Yes, yeah, science! And we get the first methylamine heist, which is pretty funny, and because of course, there is an open house while they're cooking in the basement, and this guy really wanted to see it for some reason. Also, we get the origin of the iconic blue meth, and that great Psycho Tuco scene, which led to a pretty chilling end to the season, all things considered. Number 31, Blood Money. Kicking off Season 5B is Blood Money, and we continue with the flash forward sequences with Walt visiting his old abandoned house, the word Heisenberg spray painted on the wall, and he collects the ricin from his hiding place and it's still there intact. In the present, we're right where the first half left off though, with Hank figuring out Heisenberg's true identity, but hiding the fact and keeping it to himself initially. But almost immediately after leaving the house, he has a panic attack once again. Lydia goes to the car wash and Walt pretends to not know her, just like Gus did, but She's there because of the drop in quality of the meth and wants him to get the ship running again, but Skylar tells her not to come back. I really do love Walt acting like Gus here though. Still has so much respect for the man even after everything that happened. Jesse gives
gives all of his money to Saul to give to the parents of Drew Sharp and to Kaylee, Mike's granddaughter. But he doesn't do it, and Walt talks to Jesse again and tells him to just take the money, and even tells him that he's out of the game too. And Jesse knows he killed Mike, but he still denies it. Jesse tries to just get rid of the blood money in any way he can and just starts throwing it around. And we get more of that depressed Jesse here, and I agree with people here that it gets a bit tired by this point in the series, it just happens way too much and is just kind of unnecessary in my opinion. But out of anything, it makes more sense for him to get upset about Mike being killed as well as the kid Drew, more so than it does with Gale, I think. Especially since he kills a guy early on in Season 4 and just completely forgets about it later on. But anyways, that aside, now that Walt's finally out of the game, his cancer comes back. And it's almost if when he's not in the game, he doesn't really have anything to truly live for. He's not motivated to keep pushing forward. And finally, we get the confrontation between Walt and Hank, with him finding a tracker under his car like the one they used on Gus. And I love the posturing before the garage door closes, before we get the real emotions coming out. It's not the classic detective catching the bad guy scene. It's emotional, it's sad. The monster you've been chasing for over a year turns out to be your brother-in-law, and someone right under your nose the whole time. It's just an absolutely earth-shattering revelation. Also, then, maybe your best course would be to tread lightly. Great scene. Number 30, Sunset. The first really good episode of Season 3. Again, this episode is mostly about the RV, although we do also get Jesse trying to do business without Walt using his friends Badger and Skinny Pete, while Walt meets his new lab partner Gale for the first time, and we're pretty much immediately endeared to him with his overcomplicated coffee machine, and he's just a bit quirky and weird in general, but just seems like a really chill guy. Hopefully nothing horrible happens to him. Great cook montage as always too. Also side note, somehow this cop can't hear a dude walking right behind him, like is this The Walking Dead or something? Anyways, back on topic, we have Hank investigating the RV, which prompts Walt to want to go destroy it. But Badger calls Jesse about it, and Hank tails him, leading him right to Jesse and Walt inside of the RV, and it's quite a tense scene. Thankfully though, the junkyard guy Joe came in clutch, and then Walt gets Francesca to fake a car accident with Marie, which lets them get away, and sadly they have to destroy the RV. Rip. Felt more connection to this vehicle than a lot of characters in other shows. Great death scene though too, if you will. Also, Gus tells the cousins that they can't kill Walt until their business is concluded. But I love that he made them wait like multiple days before he would talk to them and they literally did nothing. But he throws them a bone and tells them they can kill Hank instead, as he was the one who actually killed Tuco. So never mind, I guess, they really don't care about killing DEA agents in this show. Still a really good episode and great build up for Season 3 Episode 7, One Minute. Number 29, Box Cutter. Coming in from the wild finale of season 3, nobody knew what to expect or what would happen when Gus found out what Jesse and Walt did. And let me tell you, no one could have foreseen this. It all starts with a flashback of Gale unpacking stuff in the lab with a box cutter, which is the name of the episode and becomes very important later on, and Gale's death hurts all the more too, as it seems that he talked Gus into actually hiring Walt, which was of course his biggest mistake. Speaking of which, we abruptly cut to Jesse killing Gale at his apartment and pick up right where we left off in the finale. Victor captures Jesse at the crime scene and takes him back to the lab, while Skylar realizes something is wrong because Walt's car is still in the driveway, but he's not at home. Also minerals. Back at the lab, Mike has to tell Gus the situation and he starts to head over. And these guys wait here for like multiple hours. Must have been the most awkward night ever. Victor also starts to cook without Jesse or Walt, which probably contributed to him getting box cuttered. And I guess that Gus wouldn't want an inferior product, but he really threw here by killing Victor, when not only was he the most loyal of all his men, even more so than Mike, but he also knew the formula. Plus he could have just killed Jesse. I mean I get that Walt said he wouldn't cook if he did, but all he had to do was threaten Walt's family. I mean, he was willing to do that later, so why not now? Still, it makes for an epic scene, so I can let it slide. Also, Mike's reaction is awesome, pulling out his gun out of instinct, one of the only times in both series that he is actually shocked, with one of the only other times being in the season 3 finale. Also, I love Gus's silent rage and how he allows Walt to just spew. He did have good arguments though against Victor cooking, I'll give him that, and I love how slow and methodical Gus is about everything here, even putting on the chemical or hazmat suit like he's gonna cook with Victor or something, just to kill him with the box cutter. Incredible season opener for sure. Number 28, 
buyout. The wind down and aftermath of the dramatic train heist of Dead Freight and the calm before the storm of Season 5 Episode 7. Yet still as far as setup episodes go, this one is great. It's also quite a haunting and disturbing one as they deal with the killing of the kid Drew Sharp, with them even breaking down and disposing of the bike, which for all intents and purposes might as well be his corpse. Although on AMC they can't really show them putting a kid in an acid bath, but it still gets the message across. And not only is Jesse furious with Todd for killing the kid, but he's also sickened by how cold and unfeeling Walt is about the whole thing, not really caring at all, even though he acts like it bothered him. It doesn't help that Todd also doesn't even regret killing the kid either, and he even keeps the tarantula like a crazy serial killer for some sort of like prize or something, I don't know. I never thought Todd really enjoyed killing, just that he was unfeeling towards it. Like he doesn't necessarily want to kill people, but will if they get in the way of his plans. Like if you pay attention throughout the whole show, he never shows like really any emotion at all, he's a stone cold psychopath. But anyways, Mike and Jesse want out and to sell their shares of the methylamine, which obviously Walt doesn't want them to do, and we get that great conversation between Jesse and Walt where he asks him if he's in the meth business or the money business, and he responds, the empire business, which is such a great line. And he explains why, because of selling out in his past with the company Grey Matter, almost trying to compete with them through his new meth venture. Mike tries to sell the methylamine anyway to Declan, but he doesn't take the deal unless he can get all of it just to get the blue meth off the streets, basically taking over the market. And they were going to get 5 mil a piece for this deal. Like, bruh, they should have just been in the heist business, f the meth business. They could have just retired off one heist. But they let Walt get greedy, and so he won't sell his share. Although Mike tries to force him, but he comes up with a way that everyone wins, where Walt doesn't have to sell his share, and Mike and Jesse still get paid. Also, can't not mention that awkward as hell scene of Jesse staying over for dinner with Walt and Skyler. Very good episode. Number 27. Granite State. Again, we have another case of a good episode being sandwiched between two incredible top 5 type of episodes, making this one seem a little bit lesser in comparison, when in reality it's a great setup for that amazing finale. Anyways, in this penultimate episode of the series, Saul disappears to Nebraska, and for some reason Jack's gang is still down to cook meth after getting the 70 million dollars, which they explain them doing because Todd has a crush on Lydia? Okay? Also, going back to Saul for a minute, before he goes, him and Walt talk for a final time, and Saul has some good parting words, telling him to face the music and accept what he's done and just be arrested. Which now on second viewing after watching Better Call Saul is awesome. I totally forgot this happened, and it definitely makes me appreciate the ending of BCS even more, because obviously Saul took his own advice to heart, and it's fitting it took place during this time where that episode also flashes back to. So yeah, this definitely made me like that scene a lot more. Walt is still delusional though, and is trying to get Saul to stay with him and hire hitmen to kill Jack's gang, but Saul knows it's over, and Walt uses the same threats, but they no longer hold any weight. Everything is just over. This episode really just brings Walt down to his lowest point in his life, still living on, but without the one thing he truly cared about, his family. Jesse manages to briefly escape captivity, and Todd is just so merciless despite acting like his friend while he's literally chained up in a hole in the ground, because he actually kills Andrea to stop him from trying to escape again, threatening to kill Brock later on. They also break into Walt's house to tell Skylar not to say anything about Lydia instead of actually killing her like Lydia suggested, which I mean she probably didn't even remember her until you guys did all that. Walt keeps wallowing away in the cabin, desperate for any human contact, and it's sad to see the state he's in, willing to pay 10k to the guy to just keep him there a couple more hours. His ring also falls off because he's lost so much weight, but he's desperate for any kind of connection to his family, so he makes it into a necklace. He also calls Flynn at school and tries to ensure he can still get them the money, because he doesn't want it all to be for nothing, but Flynn doesn't want any of the money and tells him to just die already. It's heartbreaking stuff. This is the absolute lowest point of Walt's life, and he's actually about to turn himself in, but then realizes he can still do more and fix some of his wrongs when he sees Gretchen and Elliot on TV, and for him, everything comes full circle with even the theme song kicking in here as well. Incredible way to end off the episode. Number 26, Phoenix. This is an episode about children and parents. One is born in Holly White, Walt's daughter, while another dies, that being Donald's daughter Jane, in one of Walt's darkest moments, letting her die, choking on her own vomit. It's brutal stuff. And besides that, Walt hides his 1.2 million he got from Gus. Jesse is obviously freaking out over the stolen meth, but for some reason Walt won't just tell him that he took it. Like bruh. I guess it's just his way of punishing Jesse, but either way it's a risky move. And of course Walt wants to flex his new money, but can only show it to his newly born infant daughter. 
Also, SaveWalterWhite.com is set up by Walt Jr., but of course, Walt hates it and wants to provide for himself and knows he has the money to do it. So, him and Saul try to figure out a way that he can spend his money and launder it, and of course, Walt wants the credit because of his ego, and even drops the e-begging line, predicting the rise of DSP and the like. I mean, they already existed back then, but not like they do today, so this was pretty funny. Anyway, they decide to funnel the money through the new website, and it's similar to other schemes that Jimmy does in BCS, which is cool. Meanwhile, Jane and Jesse blackmail Walt for his cut of the money and plan to run away together with it. And we get a cool detail of Jane flipping Jesse over on his side in case he vomits, which ironically is how she died. But then of course, Walt just so happens to meet Jane's dad, adding to the depths of tragedy about to unfold. And it's crazy because Donald is actually the one who motivates Walt to go back over to Jesse's, which gets her killed. Even though Walt could have saved her, he chooses to just let her die, doing what he thinks is best for Jesse in that moment. Even so, it's still one of Walt's darkest deeds. Very powerful and tragic stuff. Number 25. Confessions. Here's where everything truly starts to break down for Walt, and everyone seemingly turns against him. Well, maybe except for Todd, who continues fanboying over him to his uncle and Kenny, telling stories about the train heist and such, which is fun, and you gotta love how into the story these guys are, despite being, you know, homicidal and crazy neo-Nazis. Things go from bad to worse though for Walt when Jesse is in custody and talking to Hank about the money he was throwing around. And he even tells him he knows Walt is Heisenberg, but Jesse doesn't want to talk, at least not yet. And for whatever reason, Hank refuses to tell the DEA about Walt being Heisenberg, and so Walt actually uses this opportunity to make a fake confession about Hank actually being the mastermind, which will stall him at least for a bit from speaking on it. I mean, that's kind of what you get for waiting too long, my guy, so I don't really feel too sorry for you on that. And bruh, the restaurant scene. Some great dark comedy moments here, seeing the server being all upbeat in the middle of this super serious family meeting about Walt being a drug lord. Marie and Hank want them to give up the kids and leave them out of this, but now they don't want to, even though they did the whole other thing earlier with the pool, but regardless, Marie pulls a gamer move and tells Walt to kill himself. At which point, Walt then leaves them with the confession tape, which is such a meme at this point, but it was actually a pretty smart move by him, even admitting to paying Hank's medical and therapy bills with the drug money. And Walt and Jesse say their final goodbyes before they come to hate each other, and it's just heartbreaking. I like to think that deep down, it wasn't all just manipulation, and he to some degree still loved Jesse like a son, which has been proven to be the case on some level, although this does start to erode over over time in this season, until he eventually saves him in the finale of course, but that's getting ahead of schedule. So Walt tells Jesse he has to disappear, with him knowing that if he doesn't, he'll just kill him like he did Mike. But it's still nice to see Jesse seeing through the manipulation tactics for a change, but the hug is still nice, even if it is just for show. But before he can leave, we get him finally realizing that Hewell stole his cigarette, meaning Walt poisoned Brock, which he figured out because Hewell pickpocketed weed off him in a similar way, which is a careless mistake by them. Like why not just take it from him directly before he left instead of being all secret about it? It makes no sense, but anyway, he storms in and gives an incredible performance demanding answers and eventually going to Walt's house to burn it down. Also unrelated, but Bro hid his gun in the soda machine in his place of work, which I don't really understand, like, of all the places, bruh, really. I'm surprised it even works still after that. Still though, a great emotionally rich payoff episode. Number 24, Tahajili. A pretty underappreciated episode, all things considered. I mean, a 9.8 score is nothing to scoff at, but it's definitely overshadowed by the next episode, which we all know what that is, and it's for good reason. But it's still a great setup for that episode. Basically, here we have Todd improving his meth cooking skills, but it's not blue, so it isn't on brand. And I also love how down to earth he can seem, and then the next second he hears that Walt wants Jesse dead, and he doesn't even react, just says, You got it. But even when Walt's hiring Jack to kill Jesse, he defends his honor and doesn't want him called a rat. In exchange, Jack wants Walt to teach Todd the cook again instead of paying him cash, and he agrees. Walt puts his plan into action and tries to lure Jesse to Andrea's house for him to be killed, but he is the one who's actually tricked by Hank and Jesse, luring him to where his money is buried. And by the time he realizes he's been tricked, it's too late, and he is finally arrested, the money being buried at their first cook site. It's all very nostalgic. But just before this, he called Jack, and they actually arrive at the coordinates, and a standoff and gunfight starts before the episode abruptly ends. Ends. But these dudes cannot hit shots like holy you guys are canceled for this number 23 cats in the bag 
Alright, so we have the follow-up to the pilot episode, Cats in the Bag, which is honestly just as good and an amazing payoff to the interesting setup and predicament that Walt and Jesse find themselves in from the previous episode. Because now they got a dead body in their RV and a live Crazy 8 locked away in their basement. And despite this being such a tragic event, this episode has a lot of comedic moments. The bickering between Walt and Jesse is always great. Well, um... He did try to kill us both yesterday, so there's that. That's what I'm trying to say. And you've also got Skylar White Yo, a certified classic. My name is Skylar White Yo. My husband is Walter White Yo. Speaking of, you've also got Skylar somehow not knowing what a MILF is. And you've got Walt running into essentially a zombie Crazy 8 in the middle of the street on his way to Jesse's. So they flip a coin and Walt is gonna have to kill Crazy 8. Meanwhile, Jesse has to dispose of Emilio using acid in a certain plastic bin, which he can't find, leading him to use the bathtub instead, which causes that awesomely gross mess at the end of the episode. And for only being the second one in this series, it's amazing. If you haven't realized by now, I'm actually a very big fan of season one. I think people tend to underrate it compared to the other ones, especially when you're talking about the rich emotional drama of season four and five. But I don't know, something about season one was just so fun to me. Number 22, Half Measures. The penultimate episode of season three, and a fantastic one at that, mostly focusing on Jesse trying to take revenge against the dealers that use Tomas to kill Combo. And we start this off with a depressing but at the same time kind of funny montage with Wendy who ends up meeting with the guys to buy Crystal, as Jesse wants her to bring them food that is poisoned. But of course this doesn't exactly go to plan, because Walt refuses to poison them with ricin, saying revenge is pointless and that they aren't murderers, which is quite delusional, even for Walt. But he's still worried and talks with Saul about getting him arrested to stop him from doing anything crazy, and Mike even comes over and suggests that they kill Jesse, which is wild, and explains how him getting arrested would only cause more problems. And I mean he's right, but damn, Mike is cold. He also tells a great story from when he was a cop and took a half measure, which is the title of the episode, and actually has a profound effect on Walt's actions later on in the episode, and basically for the whole series, really. They do try one more time to hash things out between the dealers, Jesse and Gus, which is kind of strange, like why should Gus really be revealing himself to these low-level dealers? I mean, shouldn't these guys not even know who he is? Especially if Saul at one point didn't even know who he was? Surprisingly though, they shake hands and cut a deal for no more children to be used in the drug trade, which ends with them actually killing Tomas outright. Which, as you'd expect, makes Jesse fly into a rage and drives over to kill them himself with a gun, and most likely it looks like he's gonna die in the process, but just in the nick of time, despite his pleas to stop Jesse, Walt intervenes in one of the most epic scenes in the show, running over the two dealers brutally and shooting the surviving one in the head, before saying, Run. Chills, man. Chills. Number 21. Crazy Handful of Nothing. Some people may call this the first truly fantastic episode in the series that really made people get into the show and binge the whole thing, but I would argue the pilot basically is that and gets more people invested, but there's no denying that this is a great episode. First of all, we get the iconic bald look from Walt shaving his head after undergoing chemo, and fittingly, this is also the episode where the Heisenberg alias is born, or at least that first mention of the name. We also get some great setup and payoff with the fulminated Mercury scene in the classroom, which he of course uses in the confrontation with Tuco, which which is such an amazing adrenaline pumping scene that absolutely no one expected, even if the science on it is a little iffy at best. The episode starts slow though deliberately, but explodes towards the end, I mean pun intended, right? But this is also the first appearance of Tuco, and we get the first truly innocent person that Walt screws over in the janitor Hugo, who gets in trouble for the stolen equipment at the high school, which is being investigated by Hank. Also one of the most underrated scenes in the show is Jesse giving Walt his cut of what was sold. Because of how dark this show gets, people kind of forget how funny this show was in the earlier seasons. Overall a fantastic episode. Number 20, One Minute. So yeah, what can be said? This episode from start to finish is absolutely wild. Starting it all off with a flashback to Hector and the cousins, with him almost drowning one of them, showing how the Salamancas were raised and why they're so brutal. Then Hank shows up at Jesse's house and beats the shit out of him over the thing with Marie last episode. Also damn, Jesse went psycho here. I get you got beat up pretty bad, but Jesus, this speech was crazy. I want his crusty ass. Forever. 
Saul actually wants to kill Jesse here, but Walt is surprisingly against it. Can't tell if Gale is gay for Walt or just really respects him, but it looks like Walt takes his anger out on him and they waste the whole batch, but really it just is to get Jesse back in to make up for what Hank did to him. But Jesse doesn't actually want the deal, and we gotta all admit, Aaron Paul did some great acting here. Also, definitely should have listened to his own advice here, as he ends up calling back and taking the offer. Hank ends up getting suspended from the DEA, doing the right thing and admitting what he did, but things start to look up for him when he learns that Pinkman is impressing charges. But that is before the cousins attack in that crazy final sequence. Hank is warned by a then unknown party, who turns out to be Gus, as he wants all the Saul Monk is dead. And it's quite a tense scene leading up to the actual fight itself, and it seems at least for a moment that Hank could actually die here. But bruh, these guys were dumb. Not only did they do the slow Michael Myers villain walk, but they also don't take Hank's gun away real quick, like it, it takes a second. Even if you want to go get the axe to kill him to be more dramatic or whatever, just take the gun away please. <laughs> to be fair, it looked like he was out of ammo and just found a bullet on the ground, so I mean, I guess it makes sense. Still though, it's a great scene and a great episode, and at this point it seems like Hank's killed as many or maybe even more Salamancas than Gus. Number 19, Grilled. I know Vince Gilligan is kind of the king of cold opens, but this one is especially memorable with Jesse's car, and really sets the framework for his work later on in later seasons and even better call Saul. We get the first appearance of Hector in this episode and some great banter with these two about to die out in the desert. Every plan to kill Tuco fails, which is hilarious, but it's still incredibly intense and stressful. The best part though is when Jesse really tries too hard to sell his meth to him, which actually backfires, because he ends up telling him that it has a secret ingredient, which is chili powder, which of course Tuco hates. Meanwhile, at first it looks like Hank actually finds a tracker on Walt's car or something, but apparently this holds a spare key to let him search it. Also at first I was a little confused as to how Hank actually found Jesse's car and then Tuco, but I guess these lowriders had a built in GPS tracking system, so it's cool that it's not just a plot hole. And of course we get the shootout with Hank killing Tuco. Also outro music with the bell goes so hard. Amazing episode. Number 18, Full Measure. The jaw-dropping conclusion to season three starts quietly with a flashback to younger Walt and Skylar pregnant with Walt Jr. buying their house in Albuquerque. And Brian Cranston actually does look really young here. Sometimes the flashbacks in the shows are hit or miss when it comes to immersion for characters looking younger or older, but they did a great job here. But the meat and potatoes, if you will, of the episode involves the fallout from the killing of the two dealers in the previous episode. Walt meets with Mike and Gus out in the desert and dons the iconic Heisenberg hat yet again. And I also I also like how Mike smiles as Walt tries to talk his way out of it, but then we know similar manipulation tactics are used later on on him in the same episode. Gail gets back to cooking with Walt and isn't too mad about being traded for Jesse earlier, but Gus does later float the idea of Gail taking over the lab, which is ominous. Mike then later collats these two, then Walt bangs another guy, this dude is basically cheating. Walt eventually figures out that they're gonna kill them and have Gail take over, but for some reason Jesse thinks that he can't kill him even though he was gonna kill those gang members earlier, but Walt says he'll do it. But of course that's not how it goes down, and he is able to turn the tables on Mike when he's gonna kill him though and gets Jesse to do it. And I love how shocked Mike is here, everyone underestimates Walt and it's great. Also you gotta love Jesse's loyalty here, doing what had to be done, but poor Gale just got caught between between a cat and mouse game between two monsters. Awesome scene though, great cliffhanger, and an all around fantastic episode. Number 17, and the bags in the river. We get Jesse and Walt cleaning up the mess that was Emilio, intercut with a younger Walt going through the elements that make up the human body, but we know the real meat of this episode is dealing with Crazy 8 in the basement, which of course was masterfully done. I especially like the scene where Walt puts together the pieces of the broken plate, which through no dialogue at all, pure visual storytelling, lets the audience know that Walter has to kill Crazy 8 or else he will kill him, using that missing broken piece of plate. Brilliant writing here, even in the early episodes. Also, the scene of Walt making a pros and cons list before killing someone is pretty wild, considering later on he just kills people without a second thought. 
Also, the heart-to-hearts and conversations between Walt and Crazy Eight were also great, and it definitely doesn't make it easier for Walt to kill him. In fact, it makes the scene of the plate so much more painful. Walt even tells Crazy Eight that he has cancer, something he hasn't told anyone at this point, not even Jesse or his family. And we also get a subplot with Marie and Hank thinking Walt Jr. is smoking pot, which is alright, nothing too crazy, but overall it's an amazing episode and a key milestone in Walt's transformation. Number 16. Pilot. So here we have the first episode of the series, the one that kicked off this amazing and well-crafted universe, and this episode is outstanding. It's one of the best TV show pilots ever made in my opinion. And while a lot of the earlier seasons go unappreciated by some fans because of how awesome and crazy the other seasons are, even then most people can recognize that this pilot is just so amazing. It basically just glues you to your seat and gets you to binge the whole six episode season, if not the whole series, very quickly. I mean, a lot of my friends binge this show in two weeks or less, that's just how good it is but everyone knows that. But what about this pilot drew us in? Well, it's a lot of factors. You have that really interesting hook with the flash forward in the beginning, you've got great character introductions for all of the main characters, including a microcosm of Walt's character arc included in the very first episode, great foreshadowing. But besides him, you've also got of course Skyler and Walt Jr., Hank, Marie, and of course Jesse Pinkman, everyone's favorite meth head. And of course, since day one, the dynamic between these two has driven the series and made it what it is today. Just goes to show not only how well written they are, but also how well portrayed they are by Brian Cranston and Aaron Paul, even in the first episode. Did you learn nothing from my chemistry class? No. You flunked me. Remember? No wonder. Prick. Also, it's interesting that they say Jesse's nickname is Captain Cook, but only in this episode. I don't think it's ever referenced again in the series. Kind of reminds me of when they said Marlo's nickname was Black on the wire for like one episode and then just completely dropped it. But random tangent aside, nothing is wasted in this episode. Every scene and shot has purpose, and I love it. We get Walt learning he has cancer, him going with Hank on the drug bust, reuniting with Jesse to cook meth. We get the first of many cooking montages as well, and we also have them getting attacked by Crazy Eight and Amelia and eventually Walt killing Emilio, and almost Crazy 8 as well, all in one fast-paced ride of an episode. I can't talk about this one too long or we'll be here all day, but just know it's an amazing start to a show, including an incredible hook, great characters, story setup, and cliffhanger. All perfect fuel for a late night TV binge, which I think greatly helped the series propel to the status it's reached today as possibly the most critically acclaimed show of all time. Wipe down this! Number 15. Mandala. Very underrated episode in my opinion. Starts out really strong with the death of Combo, killed by a kid, which is pretty unexpected. So Walt and Jesse have to deal with that, Jesse being more concerned over the death of his friend, and Walt more worried about them looking weak on the street. So they brainstorm with Saul, and it's a fantastic scene. So many great lines. But let's start with some tough love, alright? Ready for this? Here goes. You two suck at peddling meth. Period. Saul also knows a guy who knows a guy who knows another guy, which might actually be an extra guy in there unless you count the vet in that picture, but still, we finally get introduced to Gus and Los Poyos Hermanos, and let me tell you, no one watching this episode without spoilers expected that this guy was the kingpin, like come on. Somehow though, Walt is able to figure it out and meet with him, although Gus is having second thoughts because of Walt's partner, Jesse. Meanwhile, Jesse and Jane are getting high, and I gotta knock this episode down a few points though for the cringiest moment in TV history. And you you all know what I'm talking about. Happy birthday to you. Happy. Skyler also finds out that Ted is embezzling money through his company to keep it afloat, which I gotta admit I didn't understand a whole lot about the first time I watched the show. I mean, I was like 13, but definitely makes sense considering the financial turmoil of the times. And then we get that crazy ending where Skyler goes into labor and Walt is forced to choose literally between his family and his business, either meeting with Victor to give him the product or seeing his child be born. And we all know which he chose. Great scene, great episode. Number 14, Four Days Out. Following the masterclass that was Season 2 Episode 8, Better Call Saul, we have Four Days Out, an amazing follow-up and a great piece of one of the show's best and most underrated arcs. Walt thinks his cancer is getting worse and chooses to make hay while the sun is shining. Yeah, that's uh... That's my legal opinion. So he lies about going to see his mom for the weekend so him and Jesse can cook for days, and even lies to Jesse about their methylamine going bad instead of just telling him that he thinks he's dying. Also love when these two call each other's houses. 
Great banter between them as usual as well, and one of the best cook montages of the series. What a banger song. Beautiful shots here too. Walt even gets hyped for once after they're done cooking, but of course nothing can go right for them and Jesse leaves the keys in the ignition and they get stuck in the desert for the second time. Jesse really sold this episode at basically every chance he could, even using all their water to put out a fire. Although he does figure out that Walt is dying and that the methylamine doesn't spoil, so he's not that stupid. But the situation feels pretty hopeless until Walt finally builds a battery and they really deepen their connection here, with Walt even trusting Jesse to get his family his share if he dies. But at the end we find out that he's gonna live at least a while longer, as the thing he saw in his scan wasn't actually a tumor. And we get quite a complex display of emotions from Walt here, but mostly he's just angry because he clearly wasn't ready for the scenario of him continuing to live. Outstanding episode. Number 13, Salud. Great episode here, where do I even start? Well, I guess first off, Skylar does give a lot of their money away to Ted through a fake dead relative, with him being the beneficiary, which she does through Saul, which is pretty dumb. Like, there had to be another way out of this, bruh. And of course, because he's even more stupid, Ted immediately starts spending the money on cars, I guess, and he's delusional, thinking he's going to finance his business and get it up and running again instead of just paying his back taxes. Like, what is this dude, DSP? At least Skylar ends up admitting it was her money and eventually forces him to just pay the taxes later on, but we all know that the best part of the episode is when Jesse goes down to Mexico with Gus and Mike, and not only shows them who's boss cooking up a batch of 96% in front of their smug scientist chemists, but also Gus of course kills most of the cartel members in a Game of Thrones style moment, even going as far as to poison himself as well. Man, this guy was dedicated. Also I love how calm he is when throwing it back up, but Jesse, Mike, and Gus make their escape, and Jesse has to shoot another guy in order for them to get away, apparently also a Salamanca, though most people really forget about him in the lineup. Also a scene that's overshadowed in this episode is the moment with Walt and his son, breaking down in front of him at one of his lowest points, regarding what happened with Jesse, even accidentally calling Walt Jr. Jesse, and tells him the story of how his father died, and how he doesn't want him to remember him at his lowest, which ironically is exactly what happens, not as a weak man like he thought, but as a ruthless and evil drug lord that killed his own brother-in-law. Really it's sad stuff, but it's a great episode. Number 12, Live Free or Die. A criminally underrated episode, and I've said that a few times, but this is easily the best season premiere of the show. I mean, anything involving these three is bound to be great. Like, everyone knows Jesse and Walt have electric chemistry, but no one talks about how funny Walt and Mike are together. These two absolutely despise each other, but are forced to work together, which is just so great. They literally bicker over everything, especially in this episode, and I'm all for it. But before all that, we start the season kind of slowly and solemnly with a flash forward of a 52 year old Walter with a full beard and and hair grown back, looking weathered and disheveled. He's come back to Albuquerque and he's buying an M60 machine gun. For what reason? Not even Vince Gilligan knew at the time allegedly, which is pretty funny. But they really do love their cryptic season openers, don't they? Anyways, Mike recovers from his gunshot and returns from Mexico, only to learn that Gus is dead. Man was gone for all of a few days it seems like. He's about to kill Walt understandably before Jesse comes to his rescue, and they all have to work together to get rid of the evidence on Gus's laptop, which had surveillance with all of them on tape. But what they don't know is that it was all encrypted and this may have all been for nothing, but it's such a fun episode so I'm glad it happened. So they try to figure out what to do and it's super fun. Mike and Walt going back and forth is great, and it's awesome that Jesse is actually the one that comes up with the magnet plan. Yeah, bitch! Magnets! Oh! But of course, since this is Breaking Bad, the proposed solution doesn't just work as planned. Something always has to go wrong. Now they have to ditch the truck. Very intense moment. How do we know? Because I say so. Holy ego, but that's not all folks, got one more epic Heisenberg moment to cap it all off. Fantastic episode. We're done when I say we're done. Number 11, Hermanos. This is where season 4 really starts to take off in my opinion. We finally get to see some of Gus's backstory with the cartel, and more importantly his history with Hector Salamanca, who killed his business partner and possibly lover, Max. And since then he's vowed revenge against not just Hector and not just all the Salamancas, but the whole cartel organization as well. A slow, methodical, and painful revenge. 
blood for blood. And there's some really ominous and beautiful visuals in this episode once you can get over this yellow Mexico filter that is. All jokes aside, this episode is actually really well done. And that's not all, because Gus in the present is being investigated by the APD and DEA regarding the Gale matter, where they tell him his fingerprints were found at the crime scene, but he explains that he just went to his apartment after he invited him there for dinner because he was the recipient of one of his sponsored scholarships, and the cops buy Gus's story, all except for Hank. Also some cool foreshadowing here. Hank refuses to give up on Gus and Los Poyos and has Walt drive him back there for a really intense scene of him having to bug Gus's car with a tracker. This scene's just incredible. Again, goes to show how powerful dramatic irony can really be. Mike pulling alongside them too was gold, just watching this whole thing go down. Also, I love that Gus tells him to do it for a solid alibi. So many layers of irony and lies and deceit going on here. Also gotta love in the beginning of the scene how Walt was actually excited to talk about minerals, the first one of Hank's friends and family, being that he is a chemist, but Hank just dismisses it because they're actually not there for a mineral show. Rip. And technically you could actually count this as a setup episode, so as far as setup episodes go, this is absolutely fantastic. Number 10, Hazard Pay. So easily in my opinion, this is the most underrated episode in the entire series. Definitely a sleeper, especially in a season of non-stop bangers. First the boys look for a cook site, but none of them like the places that Saul picks out. Man really tried to sneak laser tag in there again, he's actually obsessed. But Walt does come up with a crazy idea to use bug infested houses and pest control as a disguise to cook in other people's houses. It's so weird yet so creative, I love it. Although I can't help but feel it is a bit of a convoluted plan, like it's cool but it's so nice not practical compared to the RV. I mean, taking down the lab and putting it up every time. Taz also introduced here though, gotta love him fanboying over Walt. Skinny Pete and Badger return as well, which is always wholesome. Also, Walt and Jesse sitting on the couch drinking beers with the yellow suits on, it's, it's just so iconic. Then you've got Skylar finally freaking out on Marie and telling her to just shut up, which was great. But the best scene of the episode by far is the money distribution, and for being just a four minute dialogue scene between two characters, it's one of my favorite scenes in the entire series. And like the JMM scene between Howard and Jimmy, this is the one Breaking Bad scene that I go back to more than any other. It's just amazing acting, great dialogue, and I just love how Walt and Mike bounce off each other. Not to mention how greedy Walt is here. It's just awesome. Oh. It's what you do. It's also great to see how they miss Gus too, while finally learning how being the boss isn't exactly all it's cracked up to be. So, what are they doing to further our interests? The cops are looking at them very closely. We don't want them furthering our interests. And the ending is spectacular too, with Walt insinuating at the end to Jesse that he might have to kill Mike, saying Gus killed Victor for flying too close to the sun. You can just tell how much Walt still respects Gus at the end of the day and wants to be just like him. Incredible ending to a fantastic episode and an underrated one at that. Number 9, Crawl Space. We all know that the star here is the final scene, don't worry, we'll get to that, but we open up with the aftermath of Gus's attack on Don Eladio and the cartel, and both Gus and Mike are dying, Gus from the poison and Mike who's been shot. And while Jesse remains loyal to him, they have to leave him in Mexico to recover, and thankfully even though he got into that big fight with Walt, he still refuses to let him be killed by Gus. And also, after stalling for as long as he could, Walt and Hank finally go to the chicken farm and see nothing out of the usual. But he starts to look into the laundry, which worries Walt, and in a last ditch effort to keep him away gets in a car accident. Meanwhile, we get some rug foreshadowing with Ted, who is still being stubborn and says he feels uncomfortable paying back taxes with gambling winnings. Huh? Bro, this guy is so dumb, what is he even on right now? But Skylar is also dumb because she doesn't take it back when he offers it to her. Bruh. But she does call Saul, and we get that great scene with Huel and QB, and of course Ted tripping on the rug. And before we get to the crawl space sequence, we have the scene out in the desert, which is also amazing. Gus tells him to stay away from Pinkman and the laundry, and Walt says, or you'll do what? And I love this, because it genuinely shocks Gus. One of the only times we get to see a reaction like this out of him. He didn't even react like this when his face got blown off, or when he almost died to Lalo. Because it's just that crazy of a thing to say in this situation. But it's because Walt figures he can't 
kill him yet because Jesse won't allow it. For now, at least. But Walt knows he's not playing around and goes to Saul for the disappear because Gus threatened to kill his whole family, including Hank. So Walt, you call anonymous. You call anonymous. I can't, I can't. This episode is just chock full of iconic lines. But to be honest, this episode is mostly carried by that amazing ending scene. I mean, what can be said about it that hasn't been said already? Maybe the single best scene of the entire series, and in my opinion, the best acting performance by Brian Cranston in all of Breaking Bad, and some of the best television acting ever, period. I mean, what a way to end the episode. No money to save his family, and on top of it all, his wife gave it to the guy she had an affair with. <laughs> can't help but just laugh. And that final haunting shot, I mean, wow. It's just great. What else can I really say? Number 8. End Times. Taking place immediately after the shock and awe that was Crawl Space's conclusion, we have End Times, a very underrated episode because everyone talks about Crawl Space and of course the season finale Face Off, but this one in between doesn't get as much love, but it's definitely deserving of it. Because as far as setup episodes go, this is about as good as they come. So Walt leaves while his family goes to Hank's house for protection from the DEA, while he basically waits around to die knowing he's the real main target. Side note, amazing performances all around, especially Anna Gunn in this scene. And Walt in this scene has basically pretty much given up on living and waits to die in his backyard, before eyeing the lily of the valley plant, but of course at this point we don't know what he's even thinking, and no one, and I mean no one, could have possibly predicted his insane plan. However, this is where it all starts, putting into action the poisoning of Brock through Saul, which Walt then blames on Gus as Jesse realizes his rice and cigarette is missing, thinking someone took it. And he confronts Walt about it, thinking he's the only one who knew about it, and had he will steal it, which is true. But he's playing like 5D chess here, and convinces him that Gus saw it on the cameras, and is using it as a tactic to get between them, which eventually Jesse actually believes. Insane manipulation skills here, this man is on that light Yagami level. Also great acting by Aaron Paul here as always. So Walt and Jesse finally put aside their differences and start to work together with Walt making a bomb, and Jesse trying to draw Gus to the hospital because he refuses to work due to what happened to Brock. Gus remains unkillable though through what appears to be pure instinct into the situation choosing not to get back into his car where the bomb is planted, leaving us wondering how they're going to possibly deal with him now, especially when he knows that they're out to get him. And I seriously love how they present a solution in this show to a problem or a character and ditch it, leading to just more fun and intriguing scenarios, similar to what they did with Tuco. And I mean, it makes sense, he must have realized, being the smart guy that he is, that Walt actually poisoned Brock and that he was lured there on purpose. You can actually physically see him thinking about this as he walks too, which is a great subtle acting note here. Great job by Giancarlo Esposito. And just an overall incredible penultimate episode for the season. Really can't gas it up enough. Number 7. Dead Freight. Now here we've got an all-time classic, I think most would agree. It doesn't even really feel like so much of an episode of Breaking Bad than it does like a great heist movie, because that's essentially what it is. It could stand on its own as just that. I also love it when episodes remained more focused like this and don't bounce around between storylines too much, and this one does that, focusing almost entirely on the methylamine train heist, which just makes for really engaging television. It all starts with a cold open of the kid, Drew, finding a tarantula in the desert, who ends up being killed at the end of the episode by Todd, to bring down down the spirits of both the audience and the characters after seemingly doing the impossible. What can I say though about the heist that hasn't been said already? It's amazing, plain and simple, not much else to say about it. Other than the soundtrack here, fantastic. But the scenes that weren't the heist itself were great too, like the team threatening Lydia only to find out that she didn't plant the tracker. Also the scene with Walt doing a crying routine to get into Hank's computer to bug it, that was also good stuff. And of course no one could have predicted from his mild-mannered and respectful behavior how much of a monster Todd could really be. And yeah, that's about all I got. I honestly didn't take as many notes while rewatching this one again because I was just so engrossed in it. Almost perfect episode in my opinion. Number 6. Better Call Saul all-time classic, absolutely amazing episode. By far the best of the first two or maybe even three seasons in my opinion. The whole later half of season two is just awesome. But first of all, this episode is just hilarious, definitely the funniest in the whole series. Every single interaction is gold. And people would mostly describe Breaking Bad as a crime drama, but these early first few seasons had quite a bit of comedy. Of course we get the iconic lawyer himself, Salt Goodman being introduced, and let me just say, his first scene is f***ing brilliant. You're gonna get me off, right? What do I look like? Your high school girlfriend, five fingers, no waiting? 
Immediately, he becomes the show's most likable character. Also, side note, the development that he goes through compared to how he is in Better Call Saul is just astounding. Underrated and brilliant performance by Matt Jones as well, who never gets enough credit for his work on this show. I mean, there really is just so much more to say about this episode. It could really be its own standalone movie as well, honestly. Jesse also tries to be intimidating in front of Walt, which is cute, but then they learn Badger's been arrested for selling meth, which is essentially what this episode revolves around. Also, Hank deals with the trauma of the turtle incident, and his class clown act sort of starts to fall apart. Also, of course, they get Saul to represent Badger, but he won't take a bribe to get him to not take a deal with the DEA, so they have to kidnap him and bring him out to the desert, and we also get that Lalo and Nacho reference too, which is awesome. Obviously, they didn't plan it ahead of time, but they did take this line and turn it into two great characters in this universe, so so you gotta love that. Eventually all parties come to an agreement with them setting up a fake Heisenberg to get arrested to get Badger set free, which of course doesn't go off without a hitch of course, and the fake Heisenberg sits on the wrong bench, and Walt and Jesse have to intervene, but they actually manage to get it done. It's just like a really fun side quest, and it ends with a great bookend as well, with a meth deal going down on the same bench with Badger. Just amazing stuff. Number 5. Felina and finally, we have the series finale, Felina as it's called, an anagram of the word finale, which on its own is a cool little detail, but there's also a theory that it has another meaning, that it is also comprised of the periodic table elements, Fe, Li, and Na, or iron, lithium, and sodium, standing for blood from the iron, meth from the lithium, and tears from the sodium, or blood, meth, and tears, which is pretty funny, but also definitely fits. Bravo, Vince. But anyway, in the episode itself, it starts off with a very quiet and slow scene before they take you on just a crazy ride, with Walt coming back to Albuquerque for revenge, leaving behind the watch that Jesse gave him. First, Walt makes Gretchen and Elliot get the money to his family, and he has the two best hitmen west of the Mississippi, aka Beaver and What's-His-Name, aka Badger and Skinny Pete, with laser pointers, and Walt is just so badass in this scene. The Gretchen plan was actually twofold though, not just to help his family, but also mostly to just flex on them with how successful successful he was without their help, something I didn't appreciate on my first watch, and even tells them to make sure to use his money and never theirs. He also takes revenge on them by making them cower in fear about being assassinated for the rest of their lives, so there's that. Walt also joins in on the Lydia and Todd meeting, which is also epic, and he sets up a meeting with Todd's people and poisons Lydia with ricin in her stevia, tying up all loose ends when he finally uses his M60 contraption to kill Jack and his gang, but also save Jesse, even taking a bullet for him. Finally, redeeming himself, at least somewhat. Also insanely creative way to finish off the bad guys. But of course, the named main characters are still alive, including Jack and Todd, so they can be finished off, with Walt killing Jack in the same way he did Hank, and Jesse strangling Todd. And Jesse also finally breaks free of Walt's control and doesn't listen to him when he tells him to kill him. Also, I know we're getting all emotional here, but Todd's ringtone had me dead. They exchange parting glances and Jesse finally drives off, and Walt finally dies at peace in his favorite place, a meth lab, while Baby Blue plays. What an incredible ending to the character and the show, really. It's definitely not one you'd expect or even be able to predict, but it is thoroughly satisfying and almost all loose ends are tied up, with all that's left being Jesse's trip to Alaska, which is covered in El Camino, but it's not even necessary in my opinion. Just seeing Jesse set free and Walt finally redeeming himself, at least in some small capacity, coming to terms with who he is and admitting to doing it all for himself to Skylar, I just love this conclusion. Even more so than when I first watched it when it aired back in 2013. Number 4. Gliding Overall the finale of Season 5A, and wow, what a way to end it all off. This truly was the peak of Heisenberg's empire, the height of Walt's power as a drug lord, the rise before the great fall that takes place in Season 5B. Walt and Todd dispose of Mike's body in his car, and it's pretty disturbing. Todd just totally accepts it and asks no questions, and they get rid of him with an acid bath as usual. And he even lies to Jesse, saying Mike just left town. Well, he doesn't actually lie, he just says he's gone. Doesn't get too specific, which is probably for the best. Walt then meets with Lydia, who gives him the list of names. She also wants to help expand his business into the Czech Republic, which is likely what saved her life with this new business venture proposal, as Walt was actually planning to kill her with the ricin to tie up any loose ends. Damn, this man is cold. Walt then talks to Todd and his uncle Jack about killing all the inmates at the same time across multiple prisons and actually sets it up. And we get this hilarious line from Jack. You've whacking Bin Laden wasn't this complicated. 
Even though this is actually technically an error because this takes place in 2009 and Bin Laden wasn't killed until 2011, but whatever, it's funny, it's fine. Now, there are so many memorable and great scenes that could be my favorite of the series, but the scene of the guys getting whacked in the prisons is definitely up there. It is just so fantastically brutal and insane, especially Dennis being burned alive. Just crazy stuff. Walt is definitely peak evil here. Also, the song fits so well, it's just so upbeat compared to what's actually happening. And you thought that was a great montage? Well, we get another top three montage in the Crystal Blue Persuasion Cook one, showing Walt's new business operation with Todd and Lydia, and it's also great. Probably the best cook montage of the entire series, actually. We truly see Heisenberg at the top of his game when him and Skyler look at the mountain of money. Too much to even count or weigh. A far cry from the 700,000 he initially thought he needed. Jesse learns about what Walt did with Mike's guys, and they reminisce about the old times in the RV, and it's pretty awkward. But Walt leaves him his share of the methylamine money. And he finally says he's retired from the business. Happy ever after, right? The family is back together and they all seem happy, even Skyler for a change. Well, it would have been if Hank hadn't gone to the bathroom and looked in the Walt Whitman book that he got from Gale. That one casual slip up finally reveals to Hank who Heisenberg really is. An insane reveal cliffhanger. Imagine having to wait a year for the next episode. Just so much pain. Number 3. Ozymandias Okay, now this might be a bit of a hot take. I know, I know, everyone loves this episode, and it's almost universally hailed as not just the best Breaking Bad episode, but the best episode of any TV show ever, which is a remarkable achievement. But it stands at this spot for good reason. Although I think personally a few episodes beat it out in my book, but it is close, and it's essentially still a perfect episode with amazing drama, great performances, and an emotional resonance that just can't be beat. It's the only episode in the history of IMDb to have a perfect 10 score crazy to even think about. I would absolutely have no problem if you had this at the number one spot on your list. I had a peg for that spot myself, until I completely rewatched the series. So let's just jump in I guess. We start with a flashback to season one and Walt looks exactly the same. Jesse looks quite a bit older and a little bit heavier but it's fine, because the flashback is great. Not just because it's in the same spot and it's very nostalgic, but we also get to see how far Walt's come. We see him even this early on trying to manufacture elaborate lies and it's great stuff. Back in the present time, I'm surprised Walt didn't get wall banged through the car with all this spraying and praying bruh. But Gomez is dead and Hank took a bullet. Walt begs them to spare Hank's life, as he is still holding on to that last remaining hope in the world. The thought that everything he does is for his family. For one of his family to be hurt because of him would shatter his own corrupted sense of morality and worldview. The lie that he told himself the entire series. The facade would all come crashing down. Which is exactly what happens. Shockingly, this is the episode where Walt is at his most human in the whole show. He's even willing to give up all his money to save him, but Jack quickly and suddenly kills him and takes the money. And of course, Walt falling over, it, it's a meme now, but come on, it's still great stuff from Brian Cranston. They decide to leave Walt one barrel though, and agree to at least kill Jesse as per their agreement, but this part makes no sense, I'm sorry. They're so greedy that they want him to cook meth for them, even after taking the 70 million dollars, which is just insane, bruh. Like really? I feel like only Walt would do something that dumb. Initially though, it just seems like Todd wants to torture him to find out what he told the cops, which Walt allows, and it doesn't really make any sense to want to know what he told him, I mean, it just seems like a blatant excuse to keep him alive for their operation in reality. But in the next episode, they do collect some evidence from Hank, but still, it's all just so they can find any possible way to keep Jesse alive, but it's fine. And to push things even further before they leave, Walt tells Jesse he watched Jane die, something he's held onto for so long. But even after all that, that isn't the best scene. It's this part where Walt comes home, which has been analyzed a ton and is respected as possibly the best scene in the show, and I think it's definitely up there, probably top three. And the sheer emotional wreck it leaves is just devastating, as we see Walt's family he fought so hard to keep together finally torn apart. Some of the best acting of Cranston's career in this one episode. But it's still not over. We got that incredible phone call scene where Walt has to put on his Heisenberg persona even though he's broken down to his lowest point. He acts deranged in the call, making threats to Skylar, telling her she'll wind up like Hank, making her seem just like an innocent victim, putting on this tough guy act when deep down it's crushing him. So Ozymandias, despite being the most emotionally driving episode, is just a little messy but overall still fantastic. Number 2. Say My Name 
What do I even say about this? I'm surprised the IMDb score is so low on this episode. How about I start with that? And by low, I mean a 9.5 out of 10, which is higher than a lot of the top rated episodes of most shows. But come on, I expected a 9.8 or 9.9. .9. This episode is just outstanding. First of all, best opening scene to any episode with possibly the most iconic line of the whole show. This is Heisenberg at his peak. Now, say my name. Mike and Jesse are out and it's just Walt that's taken over, with Declan now handling distribution. Skylar continues to be painfully obnoxious, but what else is new? And Walt tries to get Jesse back into the game, but he's done, even willing to not get paid just to quit. Fantastic scene by the way. No you're not, you're not done, you're not leaving, because if you leave you get nothing! You understand me? NOTHING! Jesse! So Walt has to start teaching Todd as his new cooking partner, and he's surprisingly dedicated to learning the craft, and not really concerned about the money aspect. But the main thing is the DEA is onto Mike. After his lawyer who was paying off his guys gets arrested, Walt is able to warn him just in time, but even after doing this, with Mike about to skip town, Walt kills him in a heartless and senseless act of defiance, all because he bruised his ego. Amazing scene. And I don't think Walt always intended to kill Mike here despite taking his gun, he just wanted the names of the nine guys in jail, and was willing to part ways with him if he got them, but maybe he always planned to kill him after? Either way, he taunts him in the end saying he can just get them from Lydia which is just so cruel. You're sitting there dying knowing all the money you worked for to get to your granddaughter was taken by the police, and all the people you killed, the crimes you committed were for nothing, and now the guys who worked for you and trusted you are now going to be killed by Walt. Just goes to show how much of a monster he's become at this point. Number 1. Face Off I don't think anyone is surprised to see this so high on the list. It's probably in your top 5 as well I'd guess. Maybe you didn't think it would get the number 1 spot though. But everyone knows this is definitely the best episode of season 4. But I also just think it's the best episode of the series, and one of the best conclusions to a villain I have ever seen, and we'll get to that, but it's crazy right out of the gate and really never lets go. Walt gets his bomb back from Gus's car and brings it to the hospital where him and Jesse try to decide what to do next. Great banter between these two as usual. But Jesse is taken away and questioned by the FBI and APD about how he knew about the rice and poisoning. Saul has to come to the rescue, and while that's happening, Walt tries to contact him but can't and breaks into his office and has to pay Francesca 20k, but he has to go back to his house to get it. And in a hilariously evil move by Walt, he uses his neighbor as bait for Gus's hitmen. Which, fun fact, this is actually creator Vince Gilligan's mom, and he's able to get the money and get out without being seen. Walt finds out about the nursing home and concocts his plan to destroy Gus, working with Hector to do so, because the one guy he hates more than Walt is Gus. And they put their plan into action, having Hector talk to the DEA just to lure him in, at which point we get without a doubt the greatest villain death in the history of media in my opinion. I don't care what anyone says, nothing will beat Gus Fring's death. Even when we see the plan coming, seeing this man walk out of the room, thinking even for a second that he could have survived somehow, just shows how invincible he seemed at this point in the show. Plus amazing makeup and effects work, truly. You can even see his eye muscles move even when it's gone. It's gross, it's epic, and I love it. Him showing no emotion at all and him just straining his tie is just so surreal. And it could have easily just been goofy, but in the context it's just so sick and haunting. A man who doesn't flinch in basically any situation, even in the most painful and brutal brutal death. Great character, great villain, amazing sequence and episode all together. Also Mark Margolis doesn't get enough credit for his portrayal of Hector. Even without words, he's able to convey so much hatred and sadness in this one scene, it's incredible. Then we get Walt and Jesse burning down the lab and Gus's whole empire along with it, which is awesome. And I'm just here thinking, bruh, Mike is gone for like a week and this happens, this is crazy. But then of course, who could forget that gut punch at the end when we realize it was Walt all along who poisoned Brock and manipulated everything and everyone to his favor. Crazy twist. This is Walt, or should I say Heisenberg, at his most evil and manipulative. And what can I say? It's great drama. I won.
So that was my ranking of all the Breaking Bad episodes from worst to best, in my humble opinion of course, but I'm just a random nobody on the internet, so let me know down in the comments which of the episodes are your favorite in the series. You don't have to give a complete list, but you know, give like a top 5 or top 10, let me know. And also I did say in my Better Call Saul video that I thought that it was actually a little bit better than Breaking Bad, which may be a bit of a hot take, but yes, even after rewatching Breaking Bad, I think I still stand by that, although it's a lot closer than I thought. And rewatching the show after so many years brought back so many memories, even of watching the finale when it first aired back in 2013. And the show was just as amazing as I remembered, really. Anyways though, that'll be it for this video, it's long enough already. If you enjoyed though, please leave a like and subscribe, this took a very long time to make, and we're getting very close to that 100,000 subscriber milestone. But that's about it for me, it's been me Sourcebrew, and I'll catch you all in the next video, take care, and peace out.